Okay, everybody. So uh, uh, today, um, it's a pleasure to have my co-organizer of the random geometry program here to give the colloquium, Ilya Brusberg. So Ilya is a condensed matter theorist, and he's an expert in applying sophisticated tools of mathematical physics to very hard problems in condensed matter. So he's worked on uh, solved problems using conformal field theory, worked on stochastic loner evolution, and today he's going to talk to us about another one of his favorite topics and maybe a very surprising new development, which is the Anderson transition and whether it's conformally invariant or not. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Uh, I'm grateful to the Aspen Center for Physics for uh, approving our program, Random Geometry Program, that seems to be going very well. And I'm also grateful for the opportunity to present this talk here. Um, so when I was asked to give this colloquium, I was thinking, when you usually get an invitation to give a colloquium, what is the level that you have to pitch in? And so it's you think, okay, upper uh, undergraduates maybe and then I started doing it in, in that spirit and then somebody reminded me that the audience here at the center actually consists of assisting physicists professionals and the mathematicians. <laughs> and mathematicians that's right okay so um but they're all postdocs and up and uh, theorists so I decided maybe I should up my level as well a little bit but so I cannot do it uh, both ways so what, what the plan is will be I will first give you a broad historical introduction of the bigger field of Anderson localization. Um, and then I will go to a slightly more narrow topic of Anderson transitions and some recent developments in this, in this area. And I encourage you to interrupt me and ask questions anytime they appear in your, in your head. Because I, when I give lectures, I always encourage students to stop me at any time and ask questions. I, you know, I like this feedback and I can gauge going across and whatnot. Um, and so to break ice, let me start with a quiz. Um, can you spot the difference? Anyone? Color. Color. Very good. One point. Very good point. Not the main point, though. How about that? It's a while. OK. Any difference here? Yeah. Oh, don't worry, it's not graded. So um, I will explain what these things are, but as a preview of things to come, I can tell you that the left picture has something to do with the Anderson transitions. The right picture has something to do with conformal invariant. And we'll come back to it. Okay, so here's my uh, beginning of my story, this broad historical overview. The field of localization is more than 60 years old. And it started more or less with the paper by Phil Anderson, which was titled Absence of Diffusion in Certain Random Lattices. In this paper, Anderson argued that if you have just one quantum mechanical particle with electron moving in a solid, if it's moving in the presence of random potential, it may actually localize. So the quantum mechanical eigenstates, wave functions of this electron, may be sitting at one point, the electron in this state cannot move. So that's the absence of diffusion. So the work was mostly ignored for a long time. Nobody noticed it until Sir Neville Mott started you know, popularizing it. And uh, well, in the 1977, Nobel Prize was awarded to Anderson, Mott, and Van Fleck for fundamental theoretical investigations of the electronic structure of magnetic and disordered systems. Today, I'm focusing on this second contribution, disordered systems. Right, so um, Anderson, when he gave the Nobel speech, he said this, very few believed localization at the time, and even fewer saw its importance among those who failed to fully understand it at first. Certainly its author has yet to receive adequate mathematical treatment, and one has to resort to the indignity of numerical simulations to settle even the simplest questions about it. And, you know, I, I should say that many, many of my colleagues would probably bristle at this, at this phrase of indignity of numerical simulations because they do it professionally. It's their life. They do numerical simulations up to these days. And uh, I should say that 
There's a lot of progress has been made since then, both numerical and analytical, and I will cover some of it. But even at that time, I think it was a uh, too harsh statement because Anderson himself was actually involved still in this, in this business. And um, what happened is that even before 1977, Wallace and Wagner already connected this causation physics to the idea of uh, scaling theory of critical phenomena. And Anderson joined in efforts with Elihu Abrahams, who we know very well from uh, the good friend of Aspen Center. And uh, so this famous Gang of Four paper uh, came up with a theory of localization based on renormalization group ideas. And uh, it was later put on a sort of solid field theoretical ground. Wagner, who came up with some nonlinear sigma model, describes it. The main upshot of this story is that in one and two dimensions, electrons get localized by any amount of disorder. So there's no metal at all in one dimension and two dimensions. And only in 3D, you can have a transition in a metallic state to extended states at the Fermi energy and insulating state, localized states at the Fermi energy. This is this Anderson transition that I'm going to focus later on. Okay, so um, next big discovery happened in the experimental, on experimental side, the discovery of the integer quantum Hall effect. I bet you know the story. You take two dimensional electron gas, cool it, put it in a strong magnetic field, and you measure all resistance. And then what happens is that you first see linear behavior, then this linear behavior is replaced by these beautiful steps. Uh, so the experiment was done in 1980, very quickly recognized by you know, a found discovery and awarded the Nobel Prize. The theory was amazingly created very quickly after that as well. Sort of more or less explaining the quantization of the whole conductance of these plateaus was achieved pretty quickly. Laughlin, Thales, and others. And um, uh, the thing is that when you see something of that sort, when the precision, this quantization is parts in a billion, it makes you wonder, how can it be in the sample where these measurements are made is like that? <laughs> how can you have this? And the story is that uh, these, these people, Laughlin, Thales, and others, realized that localization plays a profound role in this business. Plus topology is also a very important ingredient. The localization plus topology is what provides this precise quantization key, right? So I'm not going to explain this, but uh, it's just part of the whole picture. Now, what, what is more uh, relevant to my talk today is that this transition between the plateaus has not been explained at that time. It's sort of a very difficult story. It's much more difficult in a sense to ex explain what happens here and what happens on the plateau. And this, this, this is an example of Anderson transition in two dimensions, like this original Gang of Four paper. Now I know that there are some transitions in 2D, all in the same category of Anderson transitions. And this is still actively studied Anderson tradition. We don't know the story fully of that transition still. Okay. Now, uh, well, we can ask, so Anderson proposal was to study one single electron and random potential, but what about interactions? What do they do? And um, well, apparently people started to avoid this question in the beginning. They said, okay, so if we cannot observe Anderson localization in solids because of interaction, um, what about classical waves? The classical wave equation is very similar to the Schrodinger equation. Suppose you have some random medium with random index of refraction. Then uh, people realized that Jeff John was the first probably to point out that you can have localization of light in that situation. So that proposal was uh, welcomed by Anderson. He himself wrote this paper, uh, the question of classical localization, a theory of white paint. And uh, you may wonder what white paint has to do with it. Um, well, you should take a flashlight, put it to you know, white paint and see what happens. No matter what side you're going in, you will see light backscattered to you. So the, the bright spot in your vision will come directly to you, no matter from what direction you point your flashlight. This is sort of enhanced back reflection of the white paint is a precursor of localization of light. It's a very interesting story in itself. 
But Anderson also noticed, being you know a great guy, noticed that electromagnetic and acoustic phenomena you know, follow the same ideas. And so indeed, um, one had to separate. So before people actually managed to see this experimentally, one had to separate effects of absorption effects of localization. These are distinct and had to be sort of separated. But eventually, people managed to see localization of light and localization of acoustic wave. That's all working very nicely. And uh, I'm not going to dwell on this much, except to show these beautiful pictures. OK. So theorists were not sleeping either. So, oh, no, no, I forgot to say something else. These days, uh, you cannot give a talk in condensed matter physics without mentioning cold atoms. Because cold atoms seem to have become the universal quantum simulator of everything. So, uh, so no wonder, I mean, these uh, MO gurus, uh, they decided to localize atoms and they managed to do that. 1D, 2D, and 3D, so it all works. Yeah. So, but, uh, but theorists, what about theorists? They were not sleeping either. And, um, realize that uh, what actually happens in a given system depends very much on its symmetries. That's not surprising. We know that the phase transitions in conventional statistical mechanics models um, fall into universality classes, mostly determined by dimensionality of space and the symmetries of the system. So a similar story should be true for localization. So initially, people focused on just the time time and reversal invariance and spin rotation invariance. And if you use only these two symmetries, you discover there are three symmetry classes, which were known since uh, old times, uh, discovered by Wigner and Dyson in the studies of random uh, nuclei, uh, random matrix theory. Uh, and it is uh, in, in these classes that the original Gang of Four paper was about. It was about this what's so-called orthogonal symmetry class. Integer quantum hole is, is in this symmetry class, unitary ensemble. And uh, I should point out that even in these three conventional sort of classes, the special class uh, realized um, in a two-dimensional electron gas with strong spin-orbit interaction, where you can have a transition in two dimensions. So the, both integer quantum hole effect and this uh, transition represents critical points in yeah. two dimensions, Anderson transitions. And there are other systems where if you, if you have some additional symmetry, which is called chiral symmetry, or sublattice symmetry, is described Dirac fermions in any kind of context in high energy physics or in graphene and whatnot. Um, and plus, uh, finally, the uh, initial contribution came from Alden and Sinnerbauer in 1986, who realized it can also study uh, behavior of quasi particles and superconductors at the mean field level. And that introduces four new. Symmetry classes, really with the gen classes, with their own interesting transitions. And these 10 classes comprise the full symmetry, symmetry classification. So it was sort of rigorously proven that there's nothing else. Okay, that's it. Um, well, so I want to point out that one of these interesting classes in superconductors in two dimensions allows for a transition that is similar to integer quantum hole transition, except that the, it's not the charge that is being. Unsported unsport and quantized, but uh, spin transport is quantized in this situation. And the special feature about this guy is that it has some mappings that can be you know, used to predict some exact results. So that's going to be useful later. Right. Any questions at this point? I don't hear any questions. So I'm wondering. Tenfold way for the 10 things. Yeah. Sorry? Your title, tenfold way, is for the 10 different classes. That's right. 10 different classes, tenfold way. Uh, succeeding the threefold way of Wigner and Dyson and the eightfold way for quarks. That's, that's, what, that's what it is. Um, okay. Now, uh, experiments have been continuing and new and new discussions. Yes. Actually, I'm just going to say that Dyson's original paper had the tenfold way. Dyson's original paper has tenfold way? Wow. It doesn't seem to be well known. No, it's not known to me at least. It has a tenfold way. It has a tenfold way. Is it the same as this one or not? No. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. I should I should look it up. But okay. Thank you. Interesting. 
Well, you know, in some sense, we always reinvent the wheel. And maybe, who knows? Maybe he knew already all this. Because uh, you just said that they have, this has been proven rigorously that these are all right. Of course, as soon as as I say from other. Right, so so the statement when when I say proven rigorously means that it's a mathematical theorem, which means that there's some assumptions. Like you you situate something and you get something out. So Martin Cernbauer is very uh, fond of mathematics, and so he joined team with some mathematicians and they proved the theorem that if you postulate something, and you get distance symmetry classes, and that's it. Seems to be relevant for. Well, uh, I can tell you that. These 10 classes coincide in some sense with 10 infinite symmetries of Cartan class Cartan symmetric spaces. And uh, there are other symmetric spaces in the Cartan classification that don't come in here because they're finite dimensional, they don't form an infinite series. Wow. Okay. Um, now, uh, experiments have been going on instead. And so, of course, they, you know, I cannot do justice to them in one slide, but we have the whole huge area of physics of graphene. We have another huge area of topological states of matter. Now, now there are books now about each of them and not a single book. But uh, at this point, I only want to say that localization plays a big role in these systems and they have dis been discussed in our program in particular today. Foster gave a talk about how this is relevant to these materials. Um, right, again, what about interactions? <laughs> so, it's interesting that if you go back to Anderson's paper and state, very beginning of the paper, he's not interested in single particle quantum mechanics at all. He's interested in a strongly interacting medium where with spins and spins to each other and so on. So he only came up with this model to illustrate the, his ideas, but he realized that once you have some localization going on, it may completely disrupt normalization your system right. that's that's really out of his paper so in some sense he was uh, you know ahead by decades from the current field is called which is called under the uh, moniker many way localization people really started to think about how interactions and localization work together to maybe prevent the system from thermalizing both systems from thermalizing so this is also a very active research area and uh, experiments are being done. Again, not surprisingly, this is an ato atomic physics experiment trying to show MBL. Um, and uh, so the community of people working in these fields is, is pretty diverse because localization happens to be important for many different things. So uh, I am one of the, not so many people who work almost exclusively on this kind of topics. But some other people have to use localization ideas in their work as well. And uh, so there are localization seminar series regularly going on and localization conferences. Last one was just a few weeks ago in Sapporo and it attracted about 50 people on site and 250 online participants. So that's the size of community more or less. And uh, well, so all these topics that I mentioned have been represented and uh, uh, so, We'll keep working on this. So I'm trying to convey you the idea that this is not a dead field in spite of its uh, respectable age. So there's still some mysteries. And this is what I'm going to talk about next, about some mysteries. All right, so we're back to this picture. And so now I want to start explaining what this is. And then I will explain what this is how they are related or not related. Okay, so Anderson localization. So this is slightly more detailed description of what Anderson posed. So he looked at a single particle moving in a random potential. This is just a quantum mechanics problem. You just solve Schrodinger equation, the given energy, you find the wave function, you find the energy spectrum, that's all you need. But unlike any regular problem for an undergrads where this is just a step function or something, this is now a random potential. So the behavior of wave functions happens to be very interesting. Um, what Anderson discovered is that if you take energies which are above some critical threshold, states looks like, look like in waves more or less distorted by the presence of random potential, but they're still extended throughout the whole system and can conduct electricity in that sense. 
Okay, so extended states are presenting a metal. On the other hand, some other states at lower energies look like clumps, which are sitting at one point and exponentially decaying away from it, with a characteristic length scale called the causation length. And that length diverges as you approach this critical energy, DC. So on one side, you have localized states. The, the closer you go to the critical energy, the bigger they are coming, the fluffier, and eventually they become extended and you go to a metal. What's the probability distribution on the set of potentials? Very good question. Thank you. So, uh, so details of how the spectrum looks like depend on the distribution of the potential. The properties of Anderson transition, uh, some of them are universal, similar to universality observed in critical phenomena in the conventional stat MAC problems. And for those universal properties, the nature of the distribution doesn't seem to matter. For convenience, when you do some things analytically, you assume Gaussian distribution. That seems to be the most, uh, well, again, from the universality point of view, it doesn't matter, but it's more, most convenient to use in practical applications. Right, yes? It's a naive question. What's the difference between localization and the bound state? Ah, very good. Thank you. It's an excellent question. So, so let me give you uh, the following example. Suppose you have just one dimensional problem with this random potential. Suppose the potential is bounded. And you have, of course, states which are trapped at the bottom of the potential wells. You could imagine having energy which is above any potential barrier that is present there. What happens, that state will still be localized. And the reason for this is that you should imagine this plane wave scattered of all these potential, maximum, minimum, whatever. And these scattered waves, since it's a you know, non-tracking problem, the scattering is uh, elastic. The scattered wave have the same wave number, but they come up from all the sides and from all the, uh, from all the distances and they conspire to negatively interfere at some places and kill each other. Mm -hmm. Only at one place that you have, have some presence of this way. So that state is not trapped in a single potential minimum. It's this interference pattern that creates this, this localization. In 2D, it's even more interesting because uh, suppose you have, you go to the mountains here in Aspen, right? And you look at the topo map and you have peaks and valleys and, <laughs> and settle points. And you can have an energy just below the peaks, you would still propagate because you can avoid the peaks by going around, right? And you would still localize, again, because of the interference between the waves that causes the kind of uh, phenomena. Very good, very good question. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Like in 2D or 3D, can things localize in sort of extended, like can, can you have localization along a wire even when you're in 2D, or will the localization either be you know, sort of point for every? Um, let me try to understand your question. I'm not quite sure. So, so the usual picture is that you have some rotational invariance on average. So the localized states typically look like something spherical in a number of dimensions. There are, of course, exceptions of all kinds. I mean, like the integer quantum Hall effect, for example, when you're sitting on the plateau, all the states in the bulk are localized, but the states on the edge of the system are actually propagating, are extended. So you can have a combination of both. Things. But I'm talking right now about just conventional simple localization in this problem. Right, so um, yes. I think the question was, for example, in 3D, could you have a state that was localized around a string in the neighborhood of a string? Well, you would have to be, you would have to do something very special with your system. Uh, again, so the assumption here, I mean, okay, you can do all kinds of crazy things, of course, but the, you start with the simplest things. And the simplest thing is to assume this random potential is statistically rotationally invariant and translation invariant. So the distribution of this potential does not depend on how you rotate your system or how you translate this. But so in this case, I don't think you can have what you're describing. 
Any other questions? Maybe the point that you missed is that your variable r in the potential is the, is the radius. So you, you, you just no, no, no. This is a point in space. It's a vector, right? But the probability distribution is translational and rotational invariant. So I can I can write it for you if you want. <laughs> so the blackboard here. So I can write the probability distribution. This u of r. The typically one that is mostly common used is exponential minus some one over gamma, some strength of disorder, d d r u squared of r. So that's a that's a Gaussian distribution with the uh, Delta correlated Gaussian distribution, white noise. I don't want to keep going, but it's not obvious to me that you couldn't have systems that could randomly um, isolate on long strings. Like like where, where, what would select this place? What would be special? Oh, well, okay, just a sec. I'll, I'll take your question. Thing, are you saying that the, that a truly random potential? would never actually conspire to allow you to it's a very good point excellent thank you so much so there's a whole business of what's called optimal fluctuation in this story some some of the phenomena that i'm not not mentioning even them but but you can ask the following question what's the uh, behavior of the density of states at very very negative energies it turns out that that depends on potential conspiring they have some special configurations. And then you can estimate their probabilities and find out what the contribution to the density of states will be. But so it turns out that these, these optimal fluctuations are still spherical symmetric because you, you would have to sort of satisfy the criterion of having energy level at certain depths and also the probability to be maximal given that condition. So a cigar-shaped thing would be too improbable to have this configuration. So that's... Uh, yes. When you say the, the potential is random, you mean it's a stochastic differential equation? No, 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 no. Again, so what I mean is that this is a static potential. You see, there's no time dependence. But, but okay, that's, thank you. This is, a, again, um, you are taking me out of my comfort zone in the sense because I'm used to these things. I'm not even thinking what uh, other people may have uh, questions about. The point is the following. So it's been realized for quite some time that you have all kinds of impurities in your samples. You, you study something and it, it has dirt or impurities or vacancies or whatever. So why should you care about the properties of that particular sample? So people realize that once you have the situation, what you should be thinking about is a whole ensemble of samples that are nominally the same. So take, take a huge wafer, silicon wafer that you use to uh, print chips on. You cut it into many pieces, and nominally, each piece of this wafer will be the same in the sense of the average number of impurities, let's say. Concentration of impurities will be the same in all of them, but it will be placed differently. So those different chips, different pieces of that silicon wafer will form an ensemble, disorder realizations, and that's what I should be thinking about. So I should say that my function u is a random function drawn from some distribution, and I should think about a zillion of such samples. Then everything I measure in such a situation will be a random number. Suppose I measure conductivity of that sample, conductance of that sample, or something else. It will be a random number. And then I have to study its probability distribution in that ensemble. It's the setting, and that's very crucial to remember about this, this point. Thank you for asking. Yes. You know, you could, if I take one of the potentials now, find several solutions with energy above DC, would they accumulate at some point or just each of them um, has a maximum at different locations? Uh, again, I probably don't quite understand the question. I know, do, do this solve the system for many energies not from DC? So, so uh, well, l let me. Um, Try to okay. So the lore is that in this prob in this problem, this specific problem, right? It's a very spe precisely specified problem. Suppose you have the Laplacian uh, and the Gaussian distributed random potential like that, and the belief is that in three dimensions there is a critical threshold above which all the states are extended, and below which all the states are localized. 
Yeah. So that's the state. And then, you know, pick several energies that satisfy. So get several states. You have many, you have uh, infinitely many energies. Exactly. But now the question is, if I look at them, are they all peaked at the same location? Or very oh, oh the, which ones? These guys or these guys? Uh, localized. localized. Okay, very good. So localized states are very different in location. So you go from one level to another, it jumps 10 kilometers. So it's like, really, they're really very different from each other. And that's very important for aspects that I'm not going to touch. Um, yeah. So thanks for all the questions. I love the feedback. Um, so, okay, let me try to point out the following issue here. So you see this continuous divergence of this length scale to remind you of something that you may have seen in, in eventual phase transitions, second order phase transitions. Pick your favorite magnetic you know, model, Ising model, whatever. Then spin spin correlation functions on the dotted side, let's say, decay exponentially with the distance. But that correlation lengths, which they decay, becomes bigger and bigger as you approach the transition point, the dotted state. That should be very similar here. And indeed, so these Anderson transitions are very similar in many aspects to their conventional. Uh, Cousins, conventional continuous phase transitions. But there are crucial differences. And uh, uh, I will not mention all of them. I'll just say that it's interesting to look at the spatial structure of the critical wave function that sits somewhere in between these two extremes. Okay. So what do you think? How can you possibly go from an extended state to a localized state? And the answer is very interesting. So this is a picture of a numerical simulation of this two-dimensional two orbit metal oscillator distribution. On one side, you have extended state, which is, of course, has peaks and whatnot, but the peaks are more or, more or less the same height everywhere, right? On the other side, you have localized states, which is sharply picked just at one place. And exactly at the critical point, you have this very interesting structure that has many peaks of different heights, placed sort of more or less randomly, but this picture is supposed to be self-similar and scale invariant in the following sense. Suppose you zoom in on this area, you see the smaller peak. When you zoom in, that smaller peak will look like this big peak here after you scale. So this is some scale invariant random structure. Okay. Here's another example. That's the integer quantum hole effect. Similar, similar story. Large peaks, emptiness, small peaks, emptiness, and so on. So now I can tell you these things are either extended nor localized. And to properly characterize them, you have to invoke a special term, multifactor. Let me explain to you what these are. So this is our picture that I showed before. And what this represents is nothing but you take this critical wave function, you take its absolute value squared, you take the log of it, then you color code it, right? The colors here, there's a whole spectrum of colors. Each color represents a specific value of the log of the wave function. So why is it called multifractal? You have to now imagine that you're drawing level sets of this function, namely to cut it some height. Then only at certain points, that wave function will take that value. Those sets where the wave functions take special specific values turn out to be fractals. The fractal dimensions of those fractals depend on how, which level you're probing. That's a superposition of infinitely many fractals of different fractal dimensions. That's what multifractal is. Very in intricate structure. You can extract all these multifractal exponents from this image, and that will be a part of the story. Right. Any questions about this? Are you talking when these these size are these supposed to be eigenfunctions? This, these are critical eigenfunctions. Yeah, what what does that mean? I mean, I know what it means to have an eigenfunction of a particular Hamiltonian. What is an eigenfunction of a random Hamiltonian? Yeah, if this the is potential a potential keeps changing. Then what's the eigenfunction? So this is uh, this is an eigenfunction of a particular realization of that random Hamiltonian. Oh, so it's a randomly chosen correct, correct. Hamiltonian from the ensemble. That's right. Yep. 
do you mean that the uh, different subsets from within that sample have different fractal dimensions, or that if you were to just take a different realization of the same system, you just get a different fractal? Uh, no, again, so so let me let me try to um, so the sample itself, so okay, maybe I should I should point out the whole thing, the whole the following thing. So uh, mathematically speaking, what I'm doing, I'm studying the multifractal measure, which is given by the normalized wave function times the volume element, right? So the, this is a Lebesgue measure. This is just a regular d-dimensional sample. There's no fractality about the support of that stuff. So the wave function lives in just d-dimensional space. Main Euclidean space. Nothing, nothing fancy about it. It's this density that becomes very, very ragged and strange. So to describe this density here, I, one of the ways to do it is to say that you can look at the, its level sets, right? You, you ask where in my sample the wave function equals five. And then I draw a line where it equals five. And I ask where it's equal six. It's a different line. And these two lines have different fractal dimensions. Yes. Uh, if you cut at the tallest peak, then you're cutting only- There's no tallest peak. That's the point. There, 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 there are places where this thing diverges. Oh. So uh, the thing is that this should, this should be a normalizable wave function, right? but it doesn't prevent it from spiking up to infinity in a particular way. It's integrable, right? Um, that you never get a cut that is just a bunch of sparse points? With you never get, so, so the, Fractal dimensions become smaller and smaller as you go up in, in, in the height, but they never stop. You sort of keep going. Well, okay, it's, there's some subtlety there. Okay, but that, yeah. um, any other questions? All right, so um, let's see. So the other side of my quiz was this picture. Right? And so what can now re reveal what this thing is? This is just a picture of a, of clusters in a critical pots model. And I don't exactly remember, but just counting how many colors I have here, I think I have only three different colors here. So it's probably three point three states pots model. Um, and the difference here is the following, that you know, the colors are not scaled. There's no continuum of colors like on the previous picture, there are only three colors. So there are size boundaries between these colors. Each cluster can be surrounded by a boundary. We know that these boundaries are fractals. And in this case, the fractal dimension is the same, all the boundaries. So it's just a monofractal in that sense. There are many of them. There are loops in, within loops and so on. But each loop is a single fractal curve, the given fractal dimension. It's not a multifractal. That's the main difference. That was probably not obvious when you just look at them. But uh, that's what it is, right? On the other hand, both pictures are supposed to be self-similar and scale invariant. In the easing model, you've seen probably this picture that you take a you know, larger system, you zoom in onto a smaller system, and on the magnification, it looks the same as the original system at the critical point, if you're sitting at the critical point. Right, so um, one thing about these particular types of systems, statistical mechanics, conventional statistical mechanics in 2D, or in 3D for that matter, or any number of dimensions, is that the scale invariance is promoted to conformal invariance. So um, conformal invariance is the following. So scale invariance is just you stretch things uniformly everywhere. It, conformal invariance is a transformation. Conformal transformations are the ones that preserve angles between curves. Okay? You allow for the system to be stretched or compressed differently at different places and also rotated. If you can combine these local stretches and compressions a smooth manner, rotating things, by preserving all the angles between the, all the curves, you've achieved a conformal transformation. So it turns out that the promotion of the scale invariance to conformal invariance is a very big deal because this is a bigger symmetry. And we know from our experience, the more symmetries we have in our proposal, more we typically can say about the system. So this is not an exception here. So this is especially powerful in two dimensions, because in two dimensions, conformal transformations are specified by any analytic function, okay? Pick your favorite analytic function, and it will map one part of the complex plane to something else in another complex plane, and that transformation will be conformal. 
since the amount, the number of analytic functions we have is infinite, I have infinitely dimensional, infinite dimensional symmetry in two dimensions. In, when we translate this to the language of a field theory, that becomes a special algebraic structure called Verasoro algebra. And that Verasoro symmetry has infinitely many generators that allows you to say a lot of things, right? But even in three dimensions, you can have conformal transformations, which are, you know, in addition to rotation, translations, and scaling, involve inversion in sphere. So this is beautifully illustrating this. So in 3D and higher dimensions for that matter, the formal group, group of conformal transformations is not infinitely dimensional, it's finite dimensional. Nevertheless, it's also useful to have it when you study critical phenomena. Right, now I'm becoming more technical, so bear with me. Um, so how do we describe critical systems? Uh, microscopically, we would care about, let's say in the easing case, about the correlation function of spins, whether they are pointing in the same direction or opposite directions, how this correlation function behaves at the distance. Uh, in, in a field theory, this is encoded in, in, in the called primary fields or operators that represent those spins and other observables in the system. And uh, they have particular scaling dimensions corresponding to how they behave under scalings. And the conformal symmetry imposes very strong constraints on the here are the correlation functions of those objects. One point functions, two point functions, two point functions, so on. So up to three point functions is just product of power laws. Starting with the four point function and higher, it's more complicated, but there's still some sense which you, in which you can organize this whole thing. It's especially powerful in 2D where this infinite Verasori symmetry allows to say a lot. And some of these informal field theories solved exactly. So you know all the dimensions, you know all the correlation functions and so on. Um, also, these ideas of CFT are used in string theory, of course, as uh, any string theorist knows. And yes, CFT is a big buzzword in recent times. So this is also something where uh, this, this holographic principle is now being used in, in uh, this matter as well. And our program was partially about the, these connections. Um, but I want to focus on something else, just one very basic principle of uh, conformal theory is the so-called closing symmetry. Um, so let me try to explain it. So I'll stay on this slide for a while. So let me see what I can say. So suppose you have two fields, two, two spins in the Ising model, and you want to bring them closer and closer so if you try to think about multi-point correlation functions where all the other insertions are far away, these guys are closer and closer, then from far away, those guys, two guys, look like just a combination of single operators. That's what this operator product expansion means. So you can stick it into any correlation function, the left-hand side and right-hand side will be equal to each other. Okay. So it's just, just saying that from far away, you cannot see different, you know, different notes in that, that sheet music. It become a single, single just white pitch. That's what it is. Um, all right. Now, suppose you're studying a four point function, for one, five, two, five, three, five, four. I can use this OP in two different ways. I can use one with two, three with four, or I can fuse one with four and two with three. These two different ways of fusing would result in different expressions of the correlation function. But this is the same correlation function I'm studying. These two ways must be identical. This is what's called the crossing symmetry. And uh, it was proposed long time ago by Polyakov and others. Maybe constraints coming from this crossing symmetry are so strong that you can extract useful information just by solving this equation. So, so they envisioned some algebraic approach to theories where you don't need any Lagrangian description, no action, nothing, just these guys, and that's it. They focused on the correlation functions themselves and said that having these constraints would be sufficient to extract 
all useful information. What, what are the information, what is the information that you want to extract? You want to extract the scaling dimensions of operators. You want to, want to extract these constants called the uh, OPE coefficient. Right? And so spectacularly enough, the uh, combination of these crossing symmetry constraints and Rasora algebra in 2D indeed produce spectacular results. I mean, that's, that's the basis of dimensional CFT. But recently, uh, starting, starting in 2008, uh, Slava Richkov and collaborators realized that even in higher dimensions, you can have very efficient numerical methods of solving these constraints and extracting useful information. That created a revival in this conformal bootstrap program where you can obtain spectacular results. Let me give a few examples. So here is a picture adopted from a paper in 2016, where the dashed rectangle represents the best estimates for the critical easing model. This is the scaling dimension of the energy. This is scaling dimension of the spin. The Monte Carlo results, of course, have some errors, and that's what's represented by this box. Then come these conformal bootstrap guys do their magic. They get an island of that size. Look at this size. Look at this. This is a magnification. So the precision with which we now know the critical exponents for the easing model in three dimensions are better by orders of magnitude than the previous best estimates by any other methods. It's one advantage of doing this. Second advantage, this is, these are rigorous estimates. So, uh, given some specific properties of this model, such as unitarity and, and so on, you can say that anything that is outside of this island is forbidden. It cannot have critical exponent as here. It's, it can only be in this island. Yes? And should the distraction, has it been verified experimentally or does it purely- Ah, very good question. So, Easing model is not so, so easy to, to, to do experimentally, but my next slide will show you something amazing. Oh, not part of this slide. Look at this. So this is a fantastic story. I think it's just uh, mind blowing. So it's a transition in li liquid helium, in superfluid helium, superfluid transition, the so-called lambda point. So it's been studied for decades and it's a very, famous example of a continuous phase transition where people try to measure all kinds of critical exponents. And they realized that to reliably extract critical data from experiments, we have to avoid um, uh, gradients created by gravity. So what people do, they apply for a grant, and send this stuff to space. Okay, so the experiments that are done in the International Space Station obtain some numbers which are here. It's some, some error bars, whatnot, okay? <laughs> so that's for real experiment, the real liquid helium. And we know that by symmetry, this, is, should, this should be described by what's called O2 sigma model, O2 model in three dimensions. It's a specific field theory that you can study again by some other methods or lattice versions of it, whatnot. So the best Monte Carlo simulations of this thing are here. Error bars. Error bars of the Monte Carlo simulation and the experiments do not overlap. Do not overlap to six sigma. So they cannot, so you see something, something, something is wrong here. Either experiment is wrong or theory is wrong. Monte Carlo simulation. Something is wrong. What do you think is wrong? Sorry, the experiment was done in space. In space. We tried all kinds of things to avoid all systematic errors, gravity and so on. It's null gravity and so on. Okay, the amazing story is that the bootstrap guys with their rigorous methods come in and they say, experiment is wrong. So the Monte Carlo is consistent with the bootstrap. The experiment is not consistent with bootstrap. As I told you, bootstrap is rigorous in this setting. So anything outside their bounds is not possible, okay? So, the, so that's, uh, so I don't know, this is not resolved. This is, you see, 2020, um, and nobody knows what, what happened, but it's likely the experiments just overlooked some systematic error, okay? All right, so now let's come back to 
Would it be more reasonable to believe in the experiments instead of the theory? Sorry? <laughs> Would it be more reasonable to believe in the experiments and say something's wrong, wrong with the dynamic model instead of the other way? So, okay, what, what are the possible outcomes? It's like the story I will tell you later. So you have to say either experiment or wrong, or that is not the field theory that describes the real stuff. That's, that's possible, right? But okay, we don't know what else can describe it. I mean, we have no alternative, put it this way. Right, so let me come back to this um, multifactor wave functions. So this is actually uh, how you represent them thematically. You look at the moments of the wave function and you raise it to power Q, average over the disorder. And then the behavior scaling of this system, of these moments with the system size changes from the insulator to a metal then insulator it doesn't scale in a metal, it scales in some trivial way. And at the critical point, it scales with some non-trivial set of exponents called the multifractal spectrum. Um, well, okay. So in, in some slightly other way of doing it, you can say that you can look at the moments states, so moments of the density of states, local density of states, which again scale with the system side of some set of exponents. And it is these guys that can be mapped to a field theory. Um, I want to point out one important feature here. The, when I say a moment, it's not meaning to say that Q is an integer. Q actually, density of states is a, or absolute value of the wave function, the positive number, you can raise it to any power, any real or even complex powers. This Q form a continuum of labels, and therefore we have a continuum of exponents. X sub Q is a continuum, continuous spectrum of exponents, right? Then, so uh, as I said, these, these objects, local density of states moments, map to some specific operators in the field theory, which are scaling operators, and you can sort of have a precise correspondence when you map your disordered system to a field theory. That that's, uh, results in some fancy theory where the object that you study is a matrix, it lives in some super coset space. The, the way you should think about it is some some very symmetric object, so generalization of a sphere or hyperboloid where you can allow for rotations or Lorentz transformations of the hyperboloid. So the, uh, I'm not going to really explain this, of course, but um, what I want to say is that suppose you don't know anything about this field theory. The problem with these guys is that they are derived in the metal and to expect that they, we expect that they would work all the way to the, continue, to, the, to the fixed point, to the critical point, the Anderson transition. But as a, as, a, as a fixed point of this field theory, those interesting fixed points are strongly coupled. But we cannot access them perturbatively other than in two plus epsilon dimensions or some other tricks. So in realistic dimensions, in two dimensions or three dimensions, fixed points are inaccessible by perturbation theory. So we cannot say much about them, except we can rely on symmetry, the sigma model. And suppose we take the sigma model seriously, applies its symmetries, it's very round, very symmetric, and to, so expect that these symmetries survive as we go to the fixed point. Okay? That's, that's the assumption I'm making here. Um, then what we can do, we can derive a few results for this multifractal spectrum. So first of all, spectrum more or less look like inverted parabolas, more or less. They vanish at Q equals zero and it's another special point Q star, which in this example is equal to one. These, the dimensions are positive between zero and one, they're negative outside this range. Okay, so very strange behavior. So some exponents are negative, meaning that the corresponding moments of the density of states grow with the system size to go bigger and bigger. So nothing, nothing particularly, you know, change about this. It really simply means that the probability distribution of this density of states comes broader and broader as you increase the system size. It's so not self-averaging quantity. Yeah. The parlance and the parlance of this random system. Right. Uh, so this we have this exact symmetry spectrum. The most important observation that we can obtain from the sigma model consideration that these operators satisfy the so-called abelian fusion. I showed you an example of an OPE before where you had two operators coming together and from far away, they looked like a sum of different local operators. Here I'm saying on the right-hand side of this fusion, there's only one such operator. 
not a sum, just one. That's very important. Okay? Once you have this abelian fusion, you can actually try to, in addition, assume conformal invariance and see what happens. So all these guys, all these results are obtained just from the symmetry considerations of the sigma model. No conformal invariance necessary. Now, suppose we have conformal invariance in addition. What happens then, okay, let me skip this slide. This is a kind of technical. What happens is that you can derive an equation that the dimensions, scaling dimensions of these operators must satisfy. Again, assume conformal invariance, Verisor algebra, assume that these operators are Verisor primaries, technical condition, and assume abelian fusion. Okay. Then comes out this equation, right? And uh, this equation has been obtained a long time ago, but only relatively recently people realized that once you have continuous spectra, where Q can be taking any values, you can convert this into a differential equation and solve it, okay? The solution happens to be parabola, right? So again, logic is the following. You assume conformal invariance, you assume abelian fusion, out comes quadratic spectrum of this exponent. So it does look like an inverted parabola in this picture. But now you know that it's a parabola. It's really a parabola. So suppose now you go to your favorite system and numerically simulate it or obtain these exponents in some other way and you compare it, this prediction. If you see deviations from probability, you would say something must give here. And uh, my feeling is that the assumptions two and three are more robust because they were proving, were proven using symmetries of the sigma model. Again, up to you know, a caveat that we should believe that these symmetries survive going to the strongly coupled fixed point, right? So then what we propose is that once we see any deviation from, from probability, it would mean the absence of conformal invariance at the critical. And here we go. So in two dimensions, we can simulate the quantum call effect the model. And when we divide the spectrum by the quadratic part, parabolic part, we see the deviation from probability. That's, that's something has been seen long time ago in 2008, but now there are much more precise data still showing these deviations. And a lot of work continues on. It's quite a tension here because uh, Martin Cernbauer proposed a specific conformal field theory that is supposed to describe this transition. And that theory, of course, predicts a quadratic spectrum as expected. But we see deviations from it, so it's not clear what's going on. It's still a subject of current debate. And there's this other transition, spin quantum pole transition in class C, that again shows deviations from probability. Moreover, we can combine, we can compute some exponents analytically. I'm not going to give you all the details here, just give me a, give you a table. Some observables labeled by young tableaus. We can compute their dimensions numerically. We can compute some of them analytically. And this is the prediction of probability from conformal invariance. We clearly see the deviation. Take some number four and five twenty five are not the same, really. Big deviations. So, it's um, my last substantive slide is this. Just say a few words. So, most recent result is that we can actually go to any dimension. And do not use Verisor symmetry, but just use global conformal invariance. And some technical assumptions that I'm not really going to describe here still get the probable spectrum. Okay, so it's a very similar story. If you see something that deviates from, from parabola in three, four, five dimensions, it should mean that there's no conformal invariance. And we do know that dimensions in our dimensions are not both. That's, that's more or less the end of my story. So I wanted to um, convey to you that the Anderson localization and Anderson transitions in particular are still sort of interesting and mysterious. Uh, the message that uh, that I'm particularly uh, interested in you know, understanding better. It seems like Anderson transitions generally lack conformal invariance. Um, and when we go back to Anderson. Sorry, do you mean they lack 
I mean, is it a soft breaking of conformal invariance? Is it like a bad symmetry? And I guess but it's just not there. So, okay, so maybe I should point out something. We do believe that the scale, scaling invariance, scale invariance is there. So, so the continuous, you know, massless field theory, but the um, connection between scale invariance and conformal invariance is not that straightforward. It's not, one does not always imply the other. Like there are some technical uh, limitations where one can claim this implication, but they are not applying to our situation. Our systems avoid these technical uh, conditions. We believe, so scale invariance, we do believe. Conformal invariance, as you see, is questionable. The conformal field theories are uh, non-unitary. These are non-unitary, that's right. Our theories are certainly non-unitary, correct. Um, even if they were conformal, they would be non-unitary conformal. That's the usual. Yeah. Maybe that's believed to be the tie between them. Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. That's one of the necessary conditions to the implication from look at, from from scale but it looked scale. like you were assuming uh, abelian fusion rules. Why did you Correct. assume? Why did you assume that? In fact, it's even surprising that you only have abelian fusion rules in a GL44 sigma model. Oh, 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 yeah, that's interesting. So how that particular field theory works is a separate story. I'm not going to really to explain it, but that theory has a sector which is the, just a free boson. And the vertex operator. Okay, okay, there can be a, there can be a. Um, you know, a subsector which is abelian, but right. you know, typically in WZW models, the fusion rules are non abelian. Correct. In this one, there's a sector which is just a free boson, some specific compactification radius that gives you this uh, multifractal exponent. Right. Um, so I wanted to end up with the uh, one more quotation um, from Philip Anderson. His, his speech was local moments and localized states. And he sort of goes about uh, how he was fascinated with locality. So um, the, uh, these two finally successful grandchildren, much in common, they flew in the face of the overwhelming ascendancy at the time of the Benz theory of solids emphasizing locality. Uh, it is this fascination with local, with the, the failures of the Benz theory, which the three of us, the Nobel laureates share. And uh, finally, he says that um, both subjects are still extremely alive in 1977. But I could say that they're still alive today. And uh, moreover, the uh, locality spread out throughout the world. And the gospel of Anderson is still alive. If you Google localization, you can come up with this website, for example, and many others, by the way, right? But this website, I, I encourage you to go there and see what it is about. But uh, I want to end up with just, uh, you know, this let's go local and enjoy the local food at this in ecologically conscious center. Thank you. Yes. Can you maybe indicate uh, where in this quantum mechanical example of localization uh, um, things become non-unitary? Uh, that's a good point. Uh, so the quantum mechanics, of, of course, itself is unitary and everything is conserved and not. Um, okay, I, I, may be, I may say something technical here. So we have to deal with disorder averages, right? Technically speaking, I want to average some Green's functions for my single particle Hamiltonian. So resolvents, one over E minus H. It's a random object. I want to study its moments or products and whatnot at different points. I want to average over the disorder. So there are technical tricks to do it. One of them is a replicate trick. The other is a supersymmetry. Right? So you can do both or either. And uh, what happens is that either you take the replica limit, things become fishy, or you use supersymmetry where you immediately introduce bosons and fermions, and one of them is non compact, and that's where your non unitarity is coming. I think it's important that the exponents that he's talking about when you look at these critical wave functions, 
those you can extract if you've got a big enough sample from a single wave function. Right. So the exponents themselves can be self-averaging, but it's the field theory is a mathematical tool for extracting prob the probability distributions and that field theory is to be shown, okay. not the underlying quantum mechanics. Correct. Mm -hmm. This is like taking the average of unitary operation with single unitary or something like that. Is that so you take average of because you have all this ensemble where you have a unitary evolution in each one, but maybe it's not continuous to go from this to the the average doesn't behave well with this when you when you do the unitary operation. Well so well is it that where the unit don't so so okay I see non-unitarity of a field theory is a technical statement, right? I think the physical reason for this, if you really want to see the, the root cause of this, is that some of the objects in these ensembles of random systems are not self average It means that it fluctuates strongly from sample to sample. It, so you take this ensemble and you want to characterize some, some quantity like the local density of states, but its probability distribution, its probability distribution is extremely broad. It's, it's like log normal distribution, let's say. It, and that's that's the cause of this of these difficulties. This is like gels in classical mechanics, when you have the real flow just expands too much. See something ah. like that? Or, uh, Sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Ah. If it's it's like classical mechanics when you fix a spread out a lot. Like chaotic things? Chaotic things. Oh uh, well. Something like that or we're not looking at any time dynamics here, so I'm not sure if it's related, but well, yeah, well, I, I have to be careful here. I'm not an expert, There's, but certainly all this story has something to do with quantum chaos and, uh, and the matrix theory. I mean, that's, that's been explored by a lot of people. Please. Um, you, you made a big point about the multi fractal aspect. Was that something that potentially connects to the lack of formal variance, or is that? Um, no, no, no. So, so, so there are informally invariant multifractal measures, but all of the known ones are parabolic spectra. So, so in fact, one recent uh, sort of in, in rigorous mathematics, a, this is a groundbreaking discovery. People have rigorously constructed Lie wheel field theory, okay, with all its intricacies, DOZZ formula, and everything else. So um, that field theory is constructed rigorously from some probabilistic methods, but the, the end result is that they have some E boson slightly modified more or less. And so if you study E boson, then the, these multifractal dimensions always come out to be quadratic parabolic. So it seems like it's inescapable. Once you have conformal variance, you have quadratic spectrum. Oh, no more questions. Let's thank Gillian. Thank you.